Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Gaming Conversations. This week we have Morgan Carpenter uh, of local band Hive, uh, also numerous side projects, one being Prison Shank, who was just on the previous gaming comp. As And speaking of the gaming comp, Morgan also did layout for that compilation, as well as countless other things for Damien. Uh, he owns uh, Sweet Tooth Company, and uh, we got a lot of other things to bring up about him. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thank you. I brought my uh, Tim, I swapped up to my Tim Hortons mug. Just <laughs> I figured it would give us some good luck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was going to, uh, mine was dirty, so New Mexico is what we get. Okay, well, that's good. So I guess, yeah, just to start off with um, where you were born and raised. Uh, well, <clears throat> I was born in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast of Canada. Um, I grew up there and lived there until I was 20. And in uh, 2002, I moved from Halifax to uh, Denver, Colorado. And I lived in Denver for 10 years. And then um, about eight years ago, I moved to Minneapolis, which is where I live now. Okay, nice. Um, I know that we've, we've, you know, we, we stay in touch off and on here and we've brought up um, our upbringings, like how we got into music and everything. So uh, I know you've, you've, you know, you have a pretty supportive family with noticing like whatever you do, they kind of pushed you on it. So what was it that got you into or introduced you into playing music in general and how it came to playing more like punk and what you're doing now? Um, well, I think, uh, I, I got into music at an, like a pretty early age, you know, and, and it was, um, you know, as simple as like what my dad would listen to in the car, which was a lot of like 80s, you know, hit stuff, Tears for Fears and whatever. Um, uh, I think when I was... 10 I took up the saxophone which was my very first instrument um, and that only lasted probably less than a year before I gave that up and I was in the school band and everything for for that year um, but by that point I by the time I was 11 um, I was already listening to Metallica and Nirvana and the Beastie Boys and sort of like the maybe not so much Metallica, but the the bigger sort of, you know, punk adjacent kind of stuff at the time. Mm -hmm. This is the early to mid 90s, early 90s, I guess. Um, and uh, so after a year of saxophone, I told my parents I just wanted to play guitar because that was, you know, all the music I was listening to was rooted in guitar. So sure. um, when I was 11, I started playing guitar. Um, and I knew I knew right off the bat that if I was playing an instrument, I was playing with the intention of being in a band just because I loved around the same time I discovered live music um, there uh, in uh, Halifax at the time. And through the nineties, there was a club called Cafe Olay, which was an all ages only club. <clears throat> they operated like three to four nights a week didn't really do a whole lot else besides local shows and you know Halifax is pretty secluded so it's not like there was a revolving door of touring bands coming through the city like week after week um Halifax is like 10 hours north of Boston and 12 hours east of Montreal so it was a long haul from you know anywhere else that a band would be playing and driving from yeah so it was drive. <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, which isn't unlike most parts of Canada you can talk to any Canadian band and I actually had this conversation with Rob from Wake mm -hmm. you know less than a year ago that you know any Canadian band will tour all the way across Canada several times over uh, mostly because a it's has always been difficult for Canadian bands to get uh, visas to um, come down in the states. Yeah, and b there's only so many. You know, even though Canada is the second largest country in the world, it's so uh, 
you know, it's not as sprawled as America is. So, you know, any given city anywhere in Canada, unless you're playing small, small towns to small, small crowds, you're looking at at least a 12 hour drive between every date, Mm -hmm. which you tell an American band that and they're like, fuck that. (laughs) But that's just kind of how it is in Canada. And, you know, Rob was like, you know, it took them, um, to get from Calgary to Minneapolis. I think it was like a 24 hour drive. And that was the first to get the first date of their tour. And he, day. we're just driving today and night. Yeah. Yeah. They basically drove or no, maybe it wasn't quite that long. Um, Cause I, they drove like eight to 10 hours East from Calgary to Winnipeg. And then, you know, eight hours South to Minneapolis from Calgary. And he was just like, yeah, it was pretty good. You know, that's, that's just how it is. And <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so <clears throat> my point being, um, there, there wasn't a, a substantial amount of touring bands come th- coming through Halifax. And so if you had a music scene, it had to exist on the locals. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, this is a city with a population of 350 to 400,000, including like the, the suburbs and everything else. So, I mean, it's like college town size. So there's only so many people who are into underground punk and hardcore and metal and whatever. And um, so anyway, um, it ended up really close knit, you know, uh, you'd have a local band that would play the same club, maybe like twice a month. And that didn't seem like overkill because everyone would rather watch something than nothing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, so what it, what, when did you get involved with that camp as far as like how to like function in a band? Cause you mentioned before that you, right. Okay. Before yeah, you were so, starting to like play music, you know, like you were, you kind of had like this opportunity to play with other people and have kind of like tips and suggestions on like how to communicate or work, work right. with other people. So in, uh, I believe it was 94, um, I was 12, um, my, as part of like a, you know, during the summer when I was off school, my parents signed me up for, um, this camp called Summer Rock. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, um, kids who are new to instruments or, you know, within the first couple of years of playing an instrument. And when I say instrument, it was usually guitar, bass, drums, keyboards, you know, like the, the basics of, of like a rock band. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, I don't remember any ska band, so there must not have been many horn players. Um, but, um, <laughs> 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 um, so basically it was, um, you, you sign up and they, they group all the kids into groups of, um, you know, like four or five or six mm-hmm. maybe. And um, they basically, with an instructor, which just kind of acts as a coach, they would like introduce kids to playing in, quote, a band. Mm-hmm. So they would teach you sort of, um, you know, for anybody who wasn't playing percussively, how to, to keep on, keep in time with other instruments who are, playing something different than you're playing, how to communicate with, um, uh, say, if you're a guitar player, communicate with a drummer in a way that they would understand what you mean as far as the logistics of the song that you're playing or whatever. So they would basically just give you sort of a head start as far as how it is to play in a band. And that was huge for me because at the time, um, I had like a started. year after you got into a lot of things that was influencing you. Cause so you said it was about 11, you were getting into like metal and punk and then like, right. And I, I had been into the music for a couple of years. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, it was more just like a, you know, you're at, that's such a young age, um, that, you know, when you're nine or 10 and hearing, check your head and never mind and all of those albums that came out like you know you're hearing something that is life-changing but you don't understand what it is or oh totally you don't you can't comprehend how it's created exactly how you start from point a to point b yeah right yeah or even like what it is that you love about yeah um and uh so i just knew okay that you know 
they're playing guitar and that seems to be like the the rock instrument so i'm gonna play guitar and so anyway um probably i was playing guitar for less than a year before i did this camp and um so they um they grouped us together and i was kind of a shy kid at the time um i definitely wasn't confident in my playing and they had um you know it, and it was kind of like everyone was playing the popular songs of the time mm -hmm. um and so this was the height of the nirvana days and so we were doing a nirvana cover and at the end of at the end of the week or two weeks or whatever it was you did like a concert and it was sort of like everyone's first taste of playing live and everyone's parents and grandparents would show up to to watch you play <clears throat> and um you know these are all you know pre-pubescent to early puberty kids so everyone is nervous and awkward and whatever and uh, they were like okay well we need a a, a singer who's going to be who's going to sing and you know kind of nobody raised their hand and at the time I had long hair and you know was like you know you know dressed like a grunge guy or whatever and they were like well you're playing guitar and you look the part you got long hair you should you should sing and I, I never sang anything at 12 years old you know, right. Like, you're not planning on singing, you know, you're already worrying about just like not fucking up on, you right. know, and you got to play yeah. with people, you know, and don't. So. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was, uh, the Nirvana song was one of their easiest ones to, to play note wise, but even still, like I had no idea how to coordinate hand motion with, with singing and, sure. you know, concentrating on both at once. And, you know, they were kind of just like, you know, they gave me good, uh, good coaching, like, oh, yeah, you got this, you know, they, they were very positive about it, which is the reason if they were, just do it, pussy, I probably would have failed and never gone back to it. Stop to support your family. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, so I did it and, you know, treated everyone's grandparents to a Nirvana song being sung in one note the whole time because I've was so nervous it was just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that I remember like my first demo tape and like it's I have only a few different you know ways of singing it's just loud and louder you know like right just one ah! <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's at a different volume yeah uh, yeah that was yeah before you learn how to like you know accentuate different parts and yeah yeah so what brought it to you to the U.S. Like what was your, what was some of the decisions or, you know, purposes that you wanted to move to uh, Colorado? Um, well, technically I never really had an intention of moving to Colorado um, because Halifax is, is pretty isolated. Um, it just felt like it didn't, not so much that like I like had conquered Halifax or whatever, but um, just wanted to be part of something bigger, I guess, wanted to be somewhere where more was happening. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have like an urge to live in the U.S. Um, but that being said, in Canada, if you want to move to like a big city, it's, you know, you have Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, if you speak French. And yeah, yeah. that's kind of it. I mean, there are bigger cities, but nobody wants to live in Alberta or Winnipeg or anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, at the time, um, me and my now wife were dating, and uh, she's American, and we were trying to find some way for us to uh, be able to live in the same city together, let alone the same country together. And um, I mean, you could have said, you know, you can you can move to the U.S., but you got to move to Mobile, Alabama. And I would, all right, you know, yeah, is my girlfriend going to be there? Yeah. Um, so she had previously very briefly lived in Denver. Um, we had gone on a trip together to visit Denver and I, you know, I liked it fine. It was, you know, bigger than Halifax, that's for sure. Um, and, uh, so I enrolled in school there. Um, I ended up, uh, finding a way to pay for it and I got like visa stuff figured out. And so, uh, in 2002, uh, her and I moved to Denver um and yeah i was 20 but i didn't really know anything about denver and at the time this is the late 2000s or i mean sorry the uh, early 2000s and it's not like 
Denver like people think of Denver now because now Denver is such a hub for mm -hmm. extreme music whether it's hardcore or death metal or you know there's so much happening in Denver now at the time Denver was just kind of like cow town like sure it was a little bit southwest a lot of sort of country and you know it, there were some good bands for sure like Planes Mistaken for Stars were kind of a new band at the time and they were hot um but uh and i don't even know if they had moved to denver yet they I mean, they might have still been in peoria illinois but um anyway so yeah we uh we moved out there and uh yeah we were there for 10 years yeah and you started apprenticing uh like tattooing in denver right yeah so <clears throat> i moved out to go to school and then shortly i mean probably literally like three months after i got there um I had always wanted to be a tattoo artist and I ended up finding a tattoo apprenticeship and uh, doing that while I was going to school. Um, went to art school and then when I graduated, I was already uh, tattooing on my own and that was kind of all I wanted to do. And so mm -hmm. I just, you know, spent a way, way too much money on school and decided to completely ignore that and tattoo which was also a failure <laughs> so it so and uh so i know that we've um we've talked about that before as far as like when you were living in denver you were you know you're going to school you're apprenticing you started tattooing um and that's where you and your wife had your first child was in denver before moving yeah. to minneapolis so yeah. what what made you you two transition from denver to minneapolis was it people you knew or was it just kind of another like let's just move there no, it was much like moving to Denver. Like it was kind of like throwing a dart at the map. Um, we had never really put roots down in Denver, mostly because, I mean, we were in our 20s. Sure. It was, you know, there was still a lot of self-discovery in your, in, well, in anybody's 20s, just kind of figuring out who you, you are can, and who yeah. you're going to be. And yeah. um, thankfully, my wife and I were able to, um, you know, muscle through that and do it together and keep our mm -hmm. relationship intact. Um, because that's sort of like the, maybe like the quarter life crisis a lot of people go through where you're in your twenties and you think you know it all. And then it's like a hard, come hard on. reality to learn. <laughs> and, and, uh, but um, yeah, so we didn't have, um, we didn't have many roots in Colorado. Um, a lot of friends, but that was kind of it. I, you know, mm -hmm. I was very involved in the music scene there. Um, I, we still have a lot of friends there but it never really felt like home. So um, she's from the Midwest and wanted to be back in the Midwest. And, um, you know, I didn't really want to move to Chicago. Um, and I said I'd move to Minneapolis or Milwaukee and I just happened to find a job in Minneapolis first. Okay. So, um, but then I also had always had this, had a love affair with Minneapolis. I loved the, uh, the nineties crust scene, uh, everything around, you know, profane existence. Um, and then in the 2000s or late nineties, I guess, like disembodied and harvest and stuff like that. I loved all that sort of side of hardcore also. And I had known of extreme noise and any scene that can support a record store like that for now 25 years. It blows my mind. Something right. And even like right now with like, with, this uh pandemic going on like it's you know they're still operating doing like mail order but you know i mean like the fact right. that they're still around and and businesses are closing left and right small businesses and oh yeah, yeah. They're, they're you know they're getting by <laughs> and I, I i saw a post from them the other day asked you know saying we'll buy we're still buying record collections you, totally. you got to make an appointment type thing which is awesome i mean you know yeah. and, and you know granted that's how they survive off of their use selection but um I love that they have a handful of volunteers who have stuck it out for so long and really kept it afloat. Yeah. Because I mean, just like anything else, like there's nothing more unreliable than a bunch of punks together usually. So it's probably, yeah. I would guess very difficult to keep a, a business financially stable for sure. a, qu a quarter century. Yeah. So, um, when, uh, speaking of disembodied and everything, um, when you moved here, you, you uh, got in a band relatively quickly and obviously featured members of Disembodied. What was... Yeah, so when 
uh, when I moved to Minneapolis, I had, um, so my wife and I had had our, our first son. Uh, we have, we have two sons now who are nine and six, but our, our oldest was, um, just past one year old. And, uh, we made the move from Denver to here with him. And I had been so involved through in music through my teens and then when I moved to Denver, I, you know, within a few months, I hooked into uh, the music scene there. And then I was playing music straight for 10 years there. And then when I, we moved to Minneapolis, I thought of it as sort of like a, um, you know, fresh start. And I was, okay, I'm a dad now. It's time to slow down or whatever. But the way my mind works, it, you know, it's, you kind of, I feel like everyone has something or a few things in their lives that whether they want to or not, they just can't turn them off. And music has always been one of them. I just drawn to it, whether, whether I'm playing it or listening to it or, you know, thinking about writing it or whatever, um, you know, the, the music in a movie or something, it's just one of like, my mind is always there. And, you know, I moved here thinking, okay, I'm going to either take a break from playing music or, you know, I'm, that part of my life is done. And I'm sure a lot of people at that stage in fatherhood say that same thing. And that's, that's the end of it for them. And rightfully so. I mean, you've got serious priorities, not touring and losing money and putting out records and losing money and basically finding some way to lose money through playing music. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, it, uh, it took probably all of like two or three months after living here that um, uh, I saw that uh, Joel from Disembodied, um, Mike Paradise, uh, who's the drummer for Disembodied and, and was drummer for Threadbare and 108 and a bunch of other bands. And then Brian, the singer for Threadbare, were starting a new band called Zafan. And I mean, almost like without, like almost in a, like a... <laughs> Like I was hypnotized myself into immediately writing them on Bandcamp and being, I don't know what you guys sound like, but let me play in your band. And uh, I didn't hear back from them right away. Um, I figured, oh, they're probably getting lots of emails from strangers saying, oh, let me join your band. Sure. Um, because that's some pretty big pedigree right there, disembodied and threadbare and all the other ex members of Martyr AD. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, yeah, maybe like a month or two later, they wrote me and said, oh yeah, we've, we actually need somebody. Are you still interested? And I had kind of had one of those moments where I, I thought like they would want to be touring nonstop and have it be a full-time thing. And obviously I'm much past that point in my life where I can just disappear for months on end. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I was like, oh no, the time isn't right. And my work schedule at the time had me work at nights and every weekend and holidays and just basically the most inopportune schedule you can think of. Prepare to do nothing if you want me in your band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and which, which was kind of, kind of what I said to him. I was like, you know, I, I don't want to be the bummer. Sure. Um, and the, and uh, it was paradise that I was corresponding with and he was kind of like, well, I'm sorry to hear that. If you change your mind, let me know. And about a week went by and I was just like, fuck. And so I wrote them and I was like, okay, look, you know, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if we can make this work or not, but I, I still would love to do something if you guys haven't found somebody and they hadn't. And so I met up with uh, Joel and Mike, Brian was living in Sioux Falls at the time and kind of stated my case of who I am and where I was at. And, you know, they understood and Joel was moving to California anyway. So it's not like it was going to be an active band by any means. Sure. Um, but, but anyway, yeah, so, uh, I hooked up with them and, uh, yeah, my first practice with them, I didn't even pick up a guitar. I, they had me tracking vocals for the, the demo night one, which yeah, was, yeah. I mean, for any vocalist and you and I have talked about this for any, most vocalists, it's an intimidating thing to record in front of people because it's basically like an empty room and you're just. Here, let me pull down all the levels of every other instrument. Let me just focus on your voice right now in front of 18 people who just happen to walk in. 
Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that sounds that sounds wonderful. Let, <laughs> Great let's, idea. Let's pull out everything that might mask every inconsistency with your singing and just focus on that. And and I had hung out with Mike and Joel for all of maybe two hours at that point. You know, I I didn't know them. They didn't know me. And mm. uh but thankfully I was confident enough, you know, I had put in enough time with bands at that point in my life that uh uh you know, I, I knew what I was doing. I knew what they wanted. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it worked out well. Um, and, that, and, and that didn't last super long, but so by the time it came to an end, because Joel wound up moving and such, um, there was downtime. So clearly something new had to happen. So you and Mike, that's where you're kind of like the ones who were instigating right. it came high, right? Right, yeah. And so, so we know Joel, uh, knew Joel was moving to California and, um, you know, we had the intention of doing sort of like a long distance band, you know, writing and recording solo and sending it back and forth, which is, which, which works. And I do that a lot now. I, mm -hmm. I mean, we, that's how we operate Hive on some levels. And um, it just didn't, it didn't work. And it was probably just kind of where we were at the time it was mm -hmm. difficult to make that sort of stuff happen and uh so yeah just kind of nothing happened um we did a, a little bit we recorded um a split seven inch with primitive man and then we did a misfits cover for a cult nation comp and um but that was kind of it and Mike and I would still get together every week when our, you know, we would have our, our practice night and it was more just kind of less like sort of sitting around bullshitting. And, um, you know, we both wanted to be in a, a, a normally functioning band. And I wanted to be in a band that I could inject into the Minneapolis scene because I had adored it from afar for, years and years and i i wanted to be in a band that was that had the minneapolis sound and be a part of the minneapolis scene mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so you know it was we wanted to do something heavy but it was fast and rooted in punk and um his hero is gone has been my favorite band since 15 counts of arson came out and uh i was you know i've always wanted to do a band that sounds like and has the sort of aesthetic of his hero is gone and so that's that's what we set out on doing so i wrote some songs and he and i uh demoed them and um yeah that was uh named it hive and and found some people to play with and that was that was kind of the start of it cool so yeah. and that's so like you know, we have an understanding of like, you know, you've been playing music and you always find some way of, you know, playing some form of music. Um, but there's all these other projects that you do on the side that are um, involving, you know, all hands on. You do tattooing, you do leather work, you do a lot of different things that you said, like you kind of just put your sugar tooth stamp on it. So I guess, you know, explain how, how that started to expand while you were, you know, had a family, full time job and playing music. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, when I was a teenager in Halifax, there was, you know, it's the same as any other city. You've got a scene of say 200 people and two of them are drummers. So, you know, you've got all the drummers are playing in like every band until they don't want to do it anymore. And then the scene folds. <laughs> yeah. So um, right from the beginning, um, you know, maybe like, a year or two into playing guitar, um, I started playing drums mostly because there I, you know, it was difficult finding somebody to play drums in a band I wanted to start. So I just Especially like a style how to that you want to do because it's like, at least in my hometown, and I'm sure it's the same way in a lot of different cities is that like you could have like a handful of drummers, but it, there aren't, that isn't always necessarily like the kind of drummer that you would, right. want, you know, so it's like, they would go good with these types of bands, but mine is very, it's, it's a little bit more, I don't know. Right. Something specific. Yeah. <laughs> especially, especially if you have a vision yeah, um, exactly. for what, yeah. what you want to be doing, it's really difficult. And I always, I hate being that asshole who is like, no, 
change the way you're playing and play it like this. Yeah, you, <laughs> you know, don't, or yeah, you you're don't not doing a good enough job. To play in a way that they don't normally play. Like you want to be able to form a band with a drummer that you ha there's a reason why you 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 know you've selected one another to play in this band right because you yeah. like how they play you know that they're going to have the same kind of like you know play off from you when you're coming up with material with them you know right absolutely yeah and i i want i don't want somebody to just be a robot i i you know i want somebody to be yeah. it's a lot of work you still got to come up with shit you know it's like right. I can tell yeah. someone else how to, to do something <laughs> yeah right yeah so anyway, yeah, so, you know, in my teens, I taught myself how to play a whole bunch of different instruments. Mm -hmm. And um, so that sort of laid the groundwork for other times throughout my life where, uh, you know, I was in, uh, at one point in the 2000s, uh, you know, I had to kick a drummer out of a band like the week of recording. And I was just like, fuck it, I'll just play the drums on this, which I did. Um, and I played guitar and sang in that band too. So, I mean, like the bulk of that recording was just me. You and um, and, uh, anyway, so that's, that's kind of, I'm such a, like a, a butterfly flitting all over the place with things. Usually as far as creatively, I always want to be doing doing something and if i see something i really love i'm like, well i want to do that too or why yeah. can't i do that and so i you know i pursue anything that drips into my thick fucking skull <laughs> so <clears throat> which is a lot though i mean we're, lot, right yeah going and, through that skull yeah yeah i do it's uh there's a, there's a jay-z quote that was uh, I can't, uh, I won't even try to paraphrase it, but it's just the wheels are always turning, you know? Um, yeah. So um, musically, you know, like I've done uh, a bunch of like one man side projects where I was just really into, and it's usually this style of hardcore or whatever. And I'll, I'll just like prison shank stuff. I have a black metal band or a black metal project called Herzegovinian that I do everything for. Um, I did a, you know, like a power violence project called Pray for Death, um, uh, like an electronic thing, a bunch of other stuff. And how did I, you get into like, you know, like auto mechanics and like building bikes and doing leather work though? Like, we, you know, like as well um, as playing music, like how did, what, you know, like, yeah. When did you start getting into that? Um, well, I, um, I mean, to me, being creative isn't just like you know you pick you pick your medium and that's that's what you do whether it's um music, you know, like music paintbrush you know whatever yeah. um to me they're kind of all one and the same it's just in mm -hmm. like if you can get your mind there and make your hands do what they need to do to do it and so you know i've always been artistic even as a kid um you know i'd never had trouble getting something like something uh from my mind out through my hands like as far as painting or drawing which is still something i mean i was upstairs drawing and painting an hour ago yeah. um and so after i graduated from uh art school um and the economy tanked and i couldn't make enough money tattooing um, I couldn't find jobs in my field of study, and so I ended up having to get into a trade. And so I started um, an apprenticeship to be an electrician, and that really opened my mind to um, what you know what's possible for me. You know, I learned the like sort of how to think mechanically, okay. um, and um, you know, kind of realized like the people that you know people that build this or fix this or whatever. Well. I'm smarter than a lot of those guys. So why can't I just do it? You know, why, why do I have to pay somebody to do this for me or build this for me or, sure. you know, make, make some, something in my head a reality. Yeah. And that kind of aesthetic ties in well, of course, with anything that's, you know, of any kind of uh, underground culture, whether it's like some kind of punk or DIY right. form, like you, you, you do it because you have to, or that there's no other person that's going to be able to interpret or understand what you want to do. Be it exactly like you're playing with leather work with playing music yeah the, the yeah. layout work that artwork that you do has an aesthetic to it 
Right. And you at least yeah. apply that to like other people's aesthetics as well. Just from what I've noticed when you, because Morgan makes a lot of flyers and poster art, uh, t-shirt yeah. designs for bands in town, out of town. And that's how I came into, you know, seeing so much of it is how I became, you know, started asking Morgan to do posters for me. And mm -hmm. then it got to the point where I was just like, I asked him to do the Damien comp. And all while this is going on, he's got all these other <laughs> levels of things. Like I, right. made this <laughs> I made this, you know, wallet. I made, you know, I fixed the van. I sold this truck that I rebuilt. Like, right. Yeah. It's cool. It's, a, it's, 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 it's pretty, it's, 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 it's I don't know, it's amazing to watch. And then you also like, I get exhausted thinking about like, like he just, got, he was like up at like 5 a.m. or working at 5 a.m. And then like comes right. home. It's cool. I, it's, it's, it's admirable. It's really cool. I basically don't relax. <laughs> I, <laughs> I believe and, it, yeah. As and, and, and it's kind of true. I mean, like I, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. Um, mm -hmm. I really try not to just sit and stare at my phone a lot. Although I do, I, you know, I definitely do. Um, but I, I really try to avoid just like stagnant downtime, especially when there's so many things that I would like to do. And I know I have the ability to do that. I can, I can keep my mind on a lot of small things at once. So it's like, sure. okay, I've, you know, I've got to leave to go do this in 45 minutes. Well, I could, you know map out this painting I wanted to do in 45 minutes or I can do this step in leather work or I can yeah, yeah. you know wh whatever um and um I also I was diagnosed as obsessive compulsive at 18 I and um <laughs> uh, at the time it was a it was a real hindrance like I was just okay. anxiety ridden and I couldn't relax and you whatever know, you know how to control that energy and that that event, yeah like the exactly and such yeah. yeah. And over the last 20 years, I've learned how to make that, that part of my brain work for me rather than against me. Oh, um, okay. uh, rather than let this disorder uh, manipulate my life, I manipulate the disorder to fit my life. And yes, I don't have, like, I don't let myself have a whole lot of veg out time, mostly because at the time, or if, if I, you know, do just sit there and think or just, you know, whatever, I end up in a bad mood or, you know, I, you, you know, know, make myself at this point. Yeah. You, you know, right. what you're going to be. So it's just like, you know, why, right. why put yourself through it? You know, like avoid whatever it is that puts you in a bad mood or it makes you feel like I, I'm wasting my time. I could be doing this. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then when I was younger and when I was, you know, at the time I was diagnosed as OCD, I didn't really understand what that meant or how, um, how to avoid or why, why am I having panic attacks or how do, do I avoid having panic attacks? Mm -hmm. And um, when I realized that I can, A, I can make my mind focus on five things at once. Um, and I can get this, you know, satisfaction out of creating stuff or fixing stuff or whatever it is yeah. that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, you know, why, why, why am I not doing that? If, yeah. if I can learn a skill um, and do something with it, then why am I not? And part of it is, you know, I sort of subscribe to the, the DIY culture early on. Um, because in the nineties, especially in a small town, you kind of had to, because there wasn't, there wasn't the resources to, to bands and musicians to do stuff on your own. Um, there definitely wasn't access to information like there is now with the internet. Um, and so it was, you know, if you wanted to do something or figure something out, you really had to do it on your own. And so my mind was sort of always there, whether it was, making just making the logistics of a band work or yeah. learning how to deal with the revolving door of members in a band or whatever and as well i'm kind of a control freak and so i i could you know with hive um i've i've done all of the design and sort of artistic stuff with the band because i had this vision of the aesthetic that hive i wanted hive to represent and um, I never wanted to, just like anything else, I never wanted um, the band's identity or whatever 
whatever his identity to hinge on the vision of somebody else. Who, yeah. who, like this who is did, your aesthetic and you're, it's, you haven't really wanted to put it in anybody else's hands to interpret for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, you know, say, say you're paying somebody to do all the design stuff for your band or your brand or whatever it is. And then suddenly that person decides, well, I'm, I'm done with that. I, you know, I've, I had a kid or I'm got married and I'm moving on and I don't have time for that anymore. Then what? Then, you know, your brand or your band or whatever it is, you completely have to restructure it because now your identity hinged on somebody else. And I just hated the idea of something I love that represents me hinging on somebody else. Yeah. Not that I don't love collaborating with other people, but, um, when it comes to my projects, I always felt like this should be 100% me. And if I don't have the ability to do something that is that important to the aesthetic that I represent, then that shouldn't be the aesthetic that I am representing. You know what I mean? No, I hear you. I hear you. So, like, currently, I know that, you know, you still, obviously, um, since we have so much downtime, this is perfect because, I mean, you already do so much anyways, regardless. I feel like a lot of aspects of your life hasn't changed besides maybe playing live or practice. Right, yeah. So I know that you still do design work. You just did some stuff for, uh, some shirts for like Dillinger 4. You, do, yeah. you still do like artwork for people. Um, yep. So moving forward, like, I mean, what, what, what's, what's, what's on the plate now for, for, you know, Hive or any projects that you might be doing on the side because now you're, at home or with your own recording equipment or what have you. Right. And to be honest though, I mean, you know, my life hasn't really changed much at all. I, I work for the railroad and that's my day job and they don't stop for anything or anybody. So I, I've still been going to work like I, you know, yeah. have for the last however many years. Um, uh, my wife works from home because our, our kids from home are, are home from school, obviously. And um, so their lives are quite a bit different, but I'm still getting up before the sun every day and going to work and, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of business as usual. But um, that being said, you know, uh, Hive isn't practicing. There's obviously no live shows going on. So that, that part of my mind that would be focused on whatever it is we're practicing and then sort of mentally preparing for shows or doing posters for shows or, uh, you know, even organizing shows because I, I'll book book shows now and then. Um, uh, that's sort of out of the picture, which is nice because when something's out of my control and not happening, like I can not, I can just sort of be like, okay, that is not something I need to be thinking about. Right. Yeah. yeah. So are you doing anything else musically then currently? Like while that you, I know that you have like Hive, you know, initially has like songs that they, they want to record for like something new at some point. Yeah. So like, are you doing something in the meantime that's just kind of letting you, getting you by, so to say, <laughs> getting you like a little bit of a fix for create, being creative musically? Um, well, I, yeah, Hive has, you know, we kind of had this plan for this year where we were going to do a couple of EPs um like smaller stuff but now um with me and jim and dan all um writing stuff i mean like we have like 20 new songs that are demoed out um so we were kind of like well why don't we just do another full length that wouldn't come out until next year anyway because we try not to uh i i only like doing full lengths like every other year because otherwise you just it's like eventually your songs are just not going to be as interesting and a lot of material that maybe is super interesting gets lost in the shuffle. Um, so we're going to start working on, um, I mean, we already have the songs for a new full length, but we've got to start working on them together as a band because um, each of us will demo stuff individually and then sort of give the demo to everybody else to listen to. Um, so there's that. Um, I uh, am planning to do a prison shank full length. Um, pretty much have all the songs. I just need to, I guess, basically find the motivation to start recording it, um, which will probably actually go pretty quick compared to my process. Usually um, just a matter of setting my mind to doing it. Yeah. Um, I 
to be honest, have started writing stuff for Zafan again. So I don't know if that will happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you a lot we'll of see. back burner stuff, just kind of ready for whenever you're ready to. Do right, again. right, yeah, and and I'm also a member of Newsrot now. Newsrot is a uh, death metal band that Jim from Hive does with um, Adam, the singer for Skeleton Witch. And um, so he asked me to play bass for Newsrot, though they, they haven't played live yet. So, but it's been kind of like an idea that he's wanted to start doing live stuff, but um, I don't know when that will happen. And that's- Is he, is he primarily playing guitar then, right? In yeah, guitar? yeah, he's, he plays guitar in that, yeah. And that's, it's kind of nice because that's, that's his thing. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to, to take a passive role in that. Um, uh, Essentially, Newsrot, as far as like a live thing, will just end up like will end up being Hive with a singer <laughs> because I I think it's going to end up being all of us playing live. So um, so there's that too. Um, but yeah, and I, I guess like with music, I'm always I'm always the guy in the band that is like pushing. Like I I, I hate being stagnant, and I hate just being a band that goes through the motions, you know, just, just yeah. waits yeah. to get asked to do something. And that's when you do something like, I, I like to, you know, set goals and try to, um, you know, work towards them. Um, but when it's a situation like this, where literally nobody is doing anything and can't do anything until that lets up, I'm happy to sort of give myself some relaxed time from it because I know as soon as, you're allowed to play shows again, then, you know, the train will go back to full steam and mm -hmm. that's where my mind will go. And I'll want to, you know, be focusing on, you know, doing short tours and all that stuff again. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, I guess before we wrap up, is there anything else we want to uh, bring up that we haven't discussed? Um, um, I'm going to put some links down in the um, yeah. description here below to just anything that you have available or coming soon too so people can check out what what you do firsthand yeah for sure I guess I didn't really touch on the sweet tooth stuff that much I, you know you mentioned I have a company called sweet tooth which is uh, began as um, leather work um, which I I kind of got into through motorcycles and okay. uh, yeah I was wondering how you got involved like with the leather work in particular too yeah yeah it was mostly just through um, through motorcycle stuff, you know, I, I love motorcycles and, um, it was kind of one of those, you know, I, I love the DIY aesthetic of motorcycle culture, especially like the chopper scene. And, um, I'll often go to chopper shows and look at like the bikes that are, you know, the most sort of cobbled together just because I find it interesting how somebody can make a machine work with, you know, when you're making parts by yourself with tools that you made yourself type thing even. Sure. And one of, one of the things that caught me was um, some of the details that went into the leather work on the seat and grips oh. and whatever else, um, bags. And um, it was, it's kind of one of those trades that um, kind of like woodworking, like people see it, and they really don't realize how how it's created or the kind of detail or patience that goes into something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, uh, I started doing it. And in 20, 2012, I started doing it under the name Sweet Tooth um, and uh, kind of came up with you know, it, Sweet Tooth, the name is, has no meaning. It was just sort of like a phrase I thought up and just like every band I've ever named, I hated it like 10 minutes later. Um, but at that point you're stuck with it. So it's just kind of whatever. Um, um, I do, however, like my, my logo, I, you know, my maker's mark is sort of a tooth with a lightning bolt down through it. And um, so that, kind of became my maker's mark for everything. I'm really into imagery and aesthetic, obviously. And so I love the idea of having much like the Hive Scythe logo. I love just having 
basically a picture with no no words, but yeah. people rec recognize that as um, what it is, kind of like the Damien logo. Well, like early um, on, like I got really into um, uh, aesthetics where it was just like a sigil or a symbol, and that as mm -hmm. that idea came from uh, for for me, like what why I got into was uh, Factory Records. Um, okay. There would just be like the earlier factory records release, especially like, like the Joy Division 12 inches singles and such. It was just simple photo, a border, and then just the factory records logo. Right. Know? Like it wouldn't say anything else. And like their aesthetic was like, it could be a meeting that they had and it'd be factory number, whatever. It could be a gift they gave to somebody. The factory records building is a number. Like I was like, oh, okay. so a lot of that kind of like came back into play when we were trying during like a P2P era and dealing with mm -hmm. digital downloads and people yeah. not really wanting to buy things. I was like, well, as long as you have a digital download code, you can seriously just sell anything. You can sell a brick with it, right. you know, limited to, to three, their number right. and someone will want it. Right. You know, I mean, just with that mentality, it's like, so I, I kind of see what you were saying, like with a, a sweet tooth. Cause when I first asked was like, is it just leather work? And you're like, yeah, it's kind of a branding for an overarching kind of a thing that you do. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, it started with the leather work and then the, um, because I've kind of got my hands in a bunch of different things, that tooth logo and the sweet tooth name just kind of became the extension of me. And so often when I do design work, even though I do it under my own name and I don't have like the officiality of, you know, a design company or anything, I'll use the tooth logo as sort of a maker's mark you know, I'll usually hide it somewhere in flyers and whatever, um, just as a means of putting my stamp on it. And, you know, like the record labels, yeah. perfect Derek example Rick, is Derek Ray, it's like Iron, the Iron Maiden logo, you know, it's like a signature, yeah. it's just that little symbol. And it's just like the hunt of finding out where like Derek Riggs put his signature at. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah that's cool. I, I love, I love um, I've always loved Mark McCoy. Um, and what he does with youth attack is, I mean, perfect example, like usually it's just the, the skull on it, yeah. uh, you know, won't actually say youth attack and his branding is uh, an enormous success. And the way, you know, how like with the city hunter, like he'll make do like a limited run of 20 fucking knives or whatever, or, you know, whatever yeah, I, it is. I, I'm guilty that, yeah, I have one of those knives. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> like a knife, yeah. fuck it, I'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, or or uh, Death Traders is another good example. Not not um, music stuff, but just like an aesthetic, and just sort of have this sure. this limited thing with the logo on it. And now, while it's sort of, I mean, it's kind of the equivalent of getting like a Gucci bag or Louis Vuitton or whatever, because you're just kind of getting this thing because of brand loyalty. At the same time. It's not this mass produced thing. Everybody's so used to, you know, it's like having this idea that you can just purchase whatever it is that you want in your size or your flavor, if it's food, anytime. And it's, right. it's it makes it more unique. It's like, it's like with, I would compare it to like with like produce, you know, like people and it's like ramp onion season. It's like the window's that big and you right. gotta wait a whole other year. It's just, it's 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 a lot cooler when people work with things when they're only available and it's just not to be a snob a lot of the times it's just right do you and really especially want to continue this design of a shirt for like a decade you know it's like right <laughs> like and, and granted like some things never go out of style but in a time like this now with amazon and you know just like information like anything you need is you know a click away you know um and I'm thankful for that, you know, uh, because there's so many things in the past where, whether it's a tool or a little, a part or a, some sort of widget that I needed, but I would have no idea where to go to get it. Yeah. It, it's right there on Amazon or wherever, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's like the antithesis of that where you're creating this, this tiny little window, this tiny little thing that while everybody is not into it, there's 15 people that are or whatever, you know, um, and mm -hmm. you can call that a success because as much as I would love to sell a couple thousand copies of a record I made or 
sell a hundred wallets or you know mass produce stuff and get the financial gain of doing it. I love the idea of just having you know this small amount of stuff for whatever it is that I'm producing and having somebody who buys it know that you know my two hands went into this yeah all the or, hands on as best yeah exactly. right which is we actually i mean we kind of did like worlds colliding we did two uh hive tapes and i did these leather sleeves that go over the cassette and we did it was like limited to 50 of each one and uh these sleeves were embossed with the like the hive logo uh, and then with our most recent album, we did a limited run um, where we worked with Crown and Throne Records, who put out our last two full lengths. Um, he released a uh, hundred cassettes, and fifty of them uh, were with the leather sleeves with the cover art. I had a stamp made of the cover art, and then I basically embossed that that look that artwork onto the leather, and it's just like a sleeve that goes over it. And it was so time consuming and way more expensive than we ever could have gotten a return on it. But it's cool. But it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the point, like, a lot of people won't, they're not wired in the same way to understand why do you, why people set themselves up for like a debt. But it's like, it's more, it's not, that's not the point. Cause if that was right. the point, you wouldn't do it. Right. And you're only doing it because it's just, it's, it is unconventional. It's, it's just something that's a little bit extra that you're putting your time in that, only a handful or, you know, a, a, a crew of like 200 people are going to understand it. Right. And that's fine. Right. And that's completely the point, you know? Um, right. Yeah. And that's, that's what the investment is buying is not like this financial return of it. It's the satisfaction of, I don't know, somebody going, I get it and I want it. Or, yeah. or you know. it could be, yeah, they could, you know, it's right when they first see it, or it could be 10 years down the road. It's just like, they finally were like, I just wanted that thing forever. I would look at it at the store and then finally it was like, it took me two years and I finally bought it. Exactly. And like, yeah. And, no, I, and I'm, a, I'm a collector. Like I love collecting stuff, you know, like mm. started out with as records and, you know, instruments and art, whatever. Um, but there's just something about now, while I have a million records that are, you know, the, the exact same as the other 5,000 or copies that were made um whenever i have get something that's hand numbered or mm -hmm. there's something that makes it individual or at least like proves that it's on a small scale it's yeah. so much cooler to me and so much more important and to know that there's you know there's this is the only one exactly like this yeah um, yeah no I hear actually you. when i was when i was in college um i went to a commercial art college and um, uh, part of my stubbornness in what I was studying, I was a photo major. And this was in, uh, I started in 2002. And this was on a cusp of when digital photography was really ramping up, especially on a commercial level. For sure. And now they still would teach you the basics of using film and traditional printing and everything else. But that was quickly put to the wayside because they were like, digital photography is the future. As a professional, you're not going to have to invest the money that you do with film. So we're focusing on this because that's what is going to make you a professional success. And like everything else, I wasn't really interested in being a professional success. I wanted to be an artist, quote unquote. You wanted to, you wanted to know the skill. Like, exactly. You wanted the skills, but you know, just to have, like you were right. an electrician, you know, if there's, if you need to fix something at the house, like you're not going to call anybody, you know? Uh, like, yeah. I yeah. can do this. Yeah. And the same thing with, you know, if I had a camera and something went wrong with it, I want to be able to pull out the part that is not working and replace it and get it working again. Sure. Whereas digital camera stops working. It's like a computer. Well, the, the motherboard yeah, that, is fried. Or not me. That's not my skill set. <laughs> yeah. It's garbage now because yeah, I'll all, buy all, those, one. <laughs> all those things are made to work until they stop working. And then it's nothing. It's, you know, recyclable trash. Yeah. Um, so anyway, when I, I was in college, I, you know, and everyone went the digital route. I, 
wanted to, the, you know, the antagonist in me was like, no, I want to, I want to make art. I'm the main, the word art is in the name of this school. I want to be an artist with this stuff. And so, um, my, uh, graduating portfolio, while it, it was, uh, everyone else was doing this either high fashion, um, digital stuff, or, I mean, everything was digital other than mine. Uh, my whole, my whole portfolio was all traditional black and white, uh, medium and large format film and then traditional printing. And their dark room at the time was, they had like 30 stations in this dark room and the entire time, the like months it took me to print my portfolio, I was the only one in there for months. I was gonna say, if they were transitioning, you're probably like sick. Like I can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. And I, and I, I. I think it was a couple of years after they'd completely gotten rid of their dark room sets up setups, or they probably have it on display somewhere in the school. Like, Oh, we used to use these or whatever. <laughs> I, know. I, I, um, I, uh, I was in a, I took a photo class as a, um, uh, an extra ex extracurricular activity in, um, high school, like mm -hmm. photo that and it tied in with like offset print. And oh I yeah. Just, like, yeah. It was, it was, it was really fun because that's how I made all my, uh, the demo tape covers and like the zine that came with it in my high school band was like, I'll just yeah. print this at school, you know, like, right. Yep. Like I'm not going to pay for this really poorly laid out cover that was through this one outlet that we had in our city of 90,000 right. people. And yeah. I just remember everybody's covers looking like super lame. And I was like, not that mine looked aesthetically pleasing, but you could tell that I drew it, you know, and right. came up yeah. with like the, the layout of it. It was, it yeah. was awesome. Yeah. And one of the things I did with the, my portfolio was I would do, I would do these uh, photo prints where, um, and I mean, the idea is nothing new now, but um, my favorite photographer was, ever was this guy named Joel Peter Witkin, who um, he, he was from like the Southwest in like, uh, I want to say like forties, fifties or whatever. And um, he had this thing where he would shoot, film and then like manipulate the film and I just like basically bit everything that he had done so it was um now while my content wasn't as extreme as his you know I would like melt the negatives or cut negatives and literally like hand sew them back together and um just do all this stuff to you know you like you create an image by taking the picture and then you further create the image by what you do to the negative and then I further created the print by like when I, I, I printed, I would do it like through different kinds of paper, like so the light would come through or do it underwater or do whatever to yeah. create all these, those more multiple, of multiple layers of like getting the final right. print. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and to anyway, to come back to what I was just saying, part of the cool aesthetic of this was because I was bringing all these not completely controllable factors into the equation, every print I made was a little bit different. And while that drove a lot of people crazy, and because of my brain, it should have drove, driven my OCD brain crazy. I love the fact that if I gave somebody a print, I, I could say, it's one of there's one. nothing, there's not another one that is exactly yeah. like that. Yeah. And I went through 20 of them and I picked this one for you. And I think the people who I did that for appreciated it as much as I did. Now, you know, you're kind of, it's kind of one of those, you're preaching to your own choir with, you know, the people who do appreciate it are a small group and you know exactly who those people are. And it's just kind of like you're secluding your art to a small community, but there's nothing wrong with that. No, you know, and I mean, like, and that's where you know, to kind of even get back into everything as well, like how we met, why we work together is just like I, I try to work with people that I'm either already friends with, or people that I know I'm going to become friends with, and like right. you and I were already acquainted, we knew of each other and everything, but it was like once we started to like work together more and more, was like how we became more friends and opened, found out more about one another. Right, <clears throat> and that's how it was was with like a few other people that I work with on Damien and. And it's kind of like, it starts to open up more and you, you understand that like, there's a reason why you're working with this person, why you like their art, their music, everything. It's like, we're, you know, we may not operate the same, but we definitely have like 
a similar goal in mind for sure. Right. So I just, and yeah, I think, I just want to say thanks for all the work that you've done for us. And yeah, of course, you know, look I'm forward I'm, to like doing more, of course, you know, I'm glad that, um, yeah, we're able to make those connections and click with people that just like, there's that inherent trust with you, you, you give me a, you know, a loose idea or no idea and trust that I'm going to go to a place that you, you would want your project to be going, especially nowadays with there's, I mean, you, there's so many artists out there, just like bands. There's so many people out there with their own aesthetic or vision or their own niche to whatever it is that they're doing. You can literally find as, you know, as, fine pointed as you want to get with where you want your project to be. You can find somebody who will, who easily. will do sure. that for you easily. And you can do that with every single thing you do with somebody else. And um, I always appreciate when a band or a label owner or whoever says, you know, uh, I want you to do this thing for me. I love the aesthetic you create. So just do whatever, do whatever. Yeah, I like you and, to do what you what you need. Like, here's the basic information. Like, here's the track listings. Just you you come up with what you want to do. You know, I just right. want to see it. <laughs> right, exactly. And as pretentious as it is, like oftentimes, like I I really, you know, I want to do a good job for for the people who hire me to do stuff. And so I'll kind of try to get in the zone. Like, you know, with a lot of the stuff that you have me do, I will listen to the bands on the flyers that I'm making or um, with the, before I did like all the layout for the comp, like you sent me the early mixes of all the comps and, mm -hmm. you know, try to get in the, the headspace to yeah. do something that would best represent that. So like sure. you mentioned, I, I did some stuff for Dillinger four lately. Um, you know, I've been a big Dillinger four fan for years and years and years. And, but I still, you know, I started listening to them and, kind of trying to come up with some sort of idea that would really um, represent represent a band that is already well represented. Um, you know, uh, it's there. Everybody knows who Dillinger 4 is and it's oh, hard to- 51 in there on the coin. Right. I got, yeah. and, and that's great because only like people who are like, you know, from around here are you know, Dillinger Four fans are like, you know, no Patty is like understands where that comes from. You know, and it's just like it was yeah. a football jersey in high school or college or whatever it was, wasn't and, it? Or was uh, it? Or was it Dick? Was it uh, Dick Butkus? Dick Butkus, I believe. Yeah. Okay, Dick Butkus. I know that Patty played. You know, he was at football and wrestling. But yeah, I remember Dick Butkus. It's been a minute. And, <laughs> and what's funny is while. when when they were going through, um, you know, they they had me do. Uh, they were like, we want you to do three shirt designs. And I ended up doing four. Um, they, uh, you know, he was like, want you to do one and then just have like a 51 on the back or something like that. And I was like, okay, let's stop for a second. Tell me specifically what the 51 stands for. Oh. And he was like, he was like, it's funny that you uh, asked that because I know probably 15 people with 51 tattoos for Dillinger four. And you're the second person to ever ask me what it means in 25 years. Well, it was like, it was in, um, it was either in on the first or second full length. And it, I, it was like written somewhere. just like, I think, or was it a song title? Like, and I think that's when I, when it was that, I was like, is it Dick Butkus? And it was just, yeah, I, I, I think it was, he was like, he's like, yeah, number, you know, yeah, there there was more to it than that, um, sure. but it was I think it was Dick Butkus's number, um, and I think probably just everyone assumed that that's it. It came from that, but there was more to it, and I don't know if it's like a secret, so I don't want don't want to say. But yeah, no. Um, right. But um, we don't want to give away everything. Right, exactly, and <laughs> it's more, and that's the thing is it's more fun to not know to to have secrets. To be honest. Um, yeah. And, and I almost want to, like, whenever I see stuff like that, I almost don't want to know because oftentimes the reality is less interesting than the fantasy yeah. that I yeah. created in my head. Okay. Um, but, um, but yeah, anyway, so um, where I was going with the Dillinger 4 thing, you know, they, they had me do um, 
two shirts that they had, like one, the design was sort of already existed that they wanted reworked and then another one um, uh, was the same sort of thing, but with a different take on it. And then they were like, and the third one, just do your thing, do whatever you want. And I just thought it was, a, yeah, not that I'm like an old head or anything, which I mean, I guess to some people I am, but um, just crazy to me that I, I mean, I've loved Dillinger 4 since the 90s. And now not only are they paying me to design stuff for them, but they're saying, we, we know what you do. And so do whatever, we trust you yeah. to do whatever. We, we and that was, that was so satisfying to me for to a band that I've loved for so long to be able to say, we trust you to do whatever and represent our band with it. Awesome. And um, yeah. And so uh, yeah, that uh, all the, all of them were released, but that one shirt, the one that I, they had me do whatever on. And so that's going to come out with like a special digital release, I think next month. Cool. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just wild. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just want to say again, thank you for uh, wanting to take part of this and I'm uh, for everybody watching, I'm going to obviously have a bunch of links in the description to, you know, the Dillinger four shirts, all of high stuff, um, whatever yeah. it is that you want me to, share with the general public <laughs> yeah for sure there. i um, really I, I really do a terrible job of promoting myself as like somebody who i shouldn't say tries to make money off of my talents i mean i do make a a little bit but i in the in the sense of trying to run a successful business no i social media and like the constant updating thing is just not something i can keep up with it's a weird because it, fine I, line you know, it's, like I'll go days with the week sometimes without promoting something. And I'm like, God, fuck, I, I, I should be doing this. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. I just don't want to be that guy filling up the freaking like your, you know, whatever. Right. It is your, you know, I want people to know about it, but I think at some point I'm like, I think they get it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really, I really try to walk that fine line of uh, just, over promotion will just kill a brand to me or a band or whatever it is yeah. because it's just like, it's almost like over explaining what you're doing. It, no matter how interesting yeah. it is, when you have to explain it that much, it's just not as interesting anymore. Yeah. Here's and, all these jokes I'm about to say, and here's what they mean. Just want to let you know right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. But don't think about it. That takes too much time. I, uh, I, I just try to try to stay humble with my, my craft and whatever I'm doing. And I feel like if like, like, I don't know. I just, I still assume that like nobody really is too interested to know what it is I'm doing or what something means or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they, if they wanted to know, they ask because that's what I would do. Yeah. So if somebody asks, then, I mean, I'll give them whatever, but outside of that, I just feel awkward, you know, just ha like, putting myself out there. Now, whenever I, I do something creative, I'll put a picture on my personal Instagram or whatever. And, you know, just as, as a means of the people who I do know who are interested, but it's not like I'm trying to like sell something. It's more just like, here, here's a thing that I did. Yeah. Um, with Sweet Tooth, it's a little bit different because there is like, I mean, you know, I have to invest money into materials and everything else just to make something happen. Mm -hmm. And that is, is more of a business standpoint but I'm still terrible with it because, you know, I, I hate talking about myself if I'm not asked to do so. I have no problem talking somebody's ear off, but only if they're actually interested in doing, in hearing what yeah. I have to say. Nice. Cause otherwise I'll just be like, okay, I'll just be quiet. <laughs> that's, just, that's the Canadian in me, I guess. And, you know, <laughs> awesome. But anyway, so, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll give you a list of list of stuff to go on and hopefully somebody's interested enough to check out. For sure. All right. Well, uh, well, thanks again, man. And yeah, uh, thank you, Travis. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. You too.